This is my humble Korean kimchi theology, uh, Burst the Bubble. The Pacific Press published, the original title was actually Jesus A Sushi, uh, but they thought that it was too radical. And uh, this is topic that I teach actually for my uh, uh, degree program here at the Andrews University. I am uh, responsible for MA uh, leadership in social innovation, and I teach uh, a topic there at the School of Leadership. So uh, if you have any problem with my presentation today, please complain to Brother Lala. You know, he is the one who invited me. Uh, so, and if, if it is okay, uh, just praise God for it. Amen? Amen? All right, so God is good? All the time? All the time? Very good. We are? World we are? World All right, amen, sounds great. Well, let's have a word of prayer and begin our journey. Father in heaven, let me not speak my own wisdom and knowledge, but yours. Inspire us, educate us, enlighten us, so that we can hear your will and have a courage to follow your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this is my humble conviction. Our theology is what we think of God and speak of God and writing about God. And that theology affects how we live. It affects our ethics, ethos. So it depends on what kind of a theology you have, you will have a very different ethics of life. So if your whole journey of Christianity is based on heaven-centric faith, and you will have ethics accordingly. But if your faith is Christ-centric, then you will have very different ethics of life accordingly. Does that make sense? Okay, I, I hope you're getting there. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You know, I mean, if you are heaven-centric you know, versus uh, Christ-centric. But we will unpack you know, two different views of uh, our theology uh, as we continue our journey. Just, I will just give you an example. Uh, we, we will even interpret the Bible differently uh, based on your focus. You know, I serve as a Civil Air Patrol chaplain and I get to hang out with the different uh, faith-based community uh, leaders. And a friend of mine who is uh, the Rabbi Grusman, he teaches at Chicago uh, Hebrew College. And one day we were having, you know, uh, a cognitive disquisition. You know, you know, in academia, we like to have that sort of things, you know. In other words, we argue back and forth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we were looking at Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. You know, you know this text well. And, uh, you know, there is a specific phrase, run to and fro. And he heard, actually, from one of our, uh, uh, you know, Seventh-day Adventist uh, presenter, talking about run to and fro, referring, uh, referencing, like, flying with aircraft instead of riding a horse and using computerized system uh, rather than you know, paper and pencil, how knowledge has been increased. And so he heard that, you know, I guess, uh, expository study on Daniel and 12.4, and, and he was asking me how I interpret the Bible. <laughs> I mean, you know, th this is quite an interesting, actually, dialogue, because some of you probably heard that, right? How many have, have you heard? The knowledge shall increase by, yeah, tech, technology development and so forth. But when you really study the Daniel 12, uh, that word that Daniel has used, uh, the shuaf, it, it, it got nothing to do with that, in fact. It, it, he was actually referring to the scroll. You see, the Bible, the scroll, is rolled inwardly from outside. So it rolled up the side you know, inwardly. So in order to read the scripture, you have to move your scripture to and fro, back and forth. 
So what Daniel was talking about is as you study your Bible, your knowledge shall increase. Knowledge of God's will. It got nothing to do with the flying around with the airplane you know, or, or ride, you know, using a computerized system. As you study the words of God, you will have a better understanding. Amen. That's what it was. And then, you know, so you, you see, when you are in heaven-centric versus Christ-centric, you may approach, you interpret the Bible accordingly. You know, my wife and I, you know, we became Seventh-day Adventists in 1991. And she was Buddhist, her family, entire family Buddhist, you know, my mother's side of family Buddhist, and, and my father's side of family Catholic, and you know, we became Adventist. You know. And uh, soon we joined the Adventist movement. Uh, people were telling us, oh, you, you have to stop doing this and stop eating this and stop, you know, and you need to work on this and you need to work on that and so forth. So we were very confused. I thought we left the Buddhism. And we became Seventh-day Buddhist. And a part of that was Galatians chapter 5. You must bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit so that you will earn your salvation and you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That was the very message some of you know, uh, people were sharing with us. And I, I struggled with that because I, I went to Columbia Union College. It's now known as Washington Adventist University to study theology. And I struggled with this, literally, really. Um, and then my Greek professor, uh, Dr. Bertram from Jamaica, enlightened me. And actually, he liberated me from my bondage, really. Because I was really looking at this. How can I obtain in a perfect uh, life, sinless life, you know, uh, develop this unblemished character by working on love and joy and peace and all. And, and I continually, you know, uh, falling into, you know, uh, not so perfect life journey. And so he said, no, th this is not about, you know, you developing these characters, he said. He said, the fruit of a spirit is love. It's, it's a singular. It's not R. I know English grammar is so wicked. It has all this, you know, punctuations and uh, you know, prepositions that confuses people. But the, the, in the Koine Greek, it does not have all that sort of things. So, who is love in the Bible? God is. So, God is the love in the Bible. So, the fruit of the Spirit is God. So, when we have relationship with the Him, who God who is love, based on that relationship as a byproduct, we have what? Joy, peace, patience. So, most important thing in our journey of this amazing, you know, uh, uh, life, as a Christian, is not who we are in this life, becoming sinless human being, developing unblemished character. No. The most important question is to whom we belong and whose we are. Because that relationship defines who we are in this world. And we belong to God, who is love. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, some of you probably, you know, not having a uh, 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 complete picture uh, of this. So let me illustrate this with the visible, you know, visual aid. So orange, how many orange do you see it? One, One right? It's a singular. So when you peel up the skin, how many elements are in there? Uh, usually eight or nine, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what this is. You got it? Yes. Yeah. That's what this Galatians 5.22 is. So when we are focusing on in a Christ-centric faith, we will have a very different life journey compared to heaven-centric faith. So I ask you once again, what is 
church? How do you define church? And if you have a heaven-centric faith versus Christ-centric verse faith, you will have a very different definition. Some of you probably think that church is a building that we come to systematically and mechanically and weekly base. We come, praise God, holding hands and singing Kumbaya, and then go home. <laughs> then we do that again week after week. And, and sometimes, you know, we have become Seventh-day Eventist. Uh, we like to do lots of events. And somehow we think more events equal greater successful life. Uh, so we have become Seventh-day Eventist. And some of us think that church is organizational infrastructure, the global you know, network that we have. Or some of you probably think that church is it's not a building that we go to. Church is not a just building that we are at, but it's a community living in union with Jesus Christ, with one another and each other. Yes, there is a time and place that we come together collectively and have a fellowship and, and worship our God. But we have to remember that is not the complete picture of a church. All of us, not only collectively, but individually, we are the church. We represent the kingdom of God. We are ambassador of a kingdom of God. This is why the church begins at the end of worship service. Church begins at the end of worship hour. Every moment of your life, are you representing the kingdom of God? Are you the ambassador of the kingdom of God? And this is the reason why the LNG White remind us and gospel workers, would you mind reading this together with me? Ready? Here you go. The sacrifice of a Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. So at the cross of Calvary, not only we see his death and resurrection, but we must see how he lived his life. I know death and resurrection is an important component of our belief. I'm not denigrating that at all. But we must understand and must able to see how he lived his life at the cross of Calvary, because that is a life that we ought to follow. This is why the Ellen White was very adamant, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, we must study in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. And, and she continued and, and saying this, we are not seeking a second coming of our, our Lord Jesus Christ from where we stand. You know, we, it, it, Jesus is not coming through our careful observation. It's not about how many wars and famines and disasters and crimes that we can identify. COVID-19, those are not the sign of his homecoming. Amen. In fact, Jesus, in you know, Ellen G. White reminds us we must seek his coming through the cross of Calvary. So we are not working toward to victory, we are working from the victory. Amen. We are not working toward to salvation, we are working from the salvation. This is the very reason salvation is not to obtain through your merits, your works, your deeds, but to retain through the grace of God, the mercy of God. Amen? So, the bottom line is, is not when he is coming. Focus should be, where is the kingdom of God today because of our faithful presence? Amen. Are we the tangible, recognizable, visible sign of a salvation in our homes and neighbors and communities? So, where is the kingdom of God today? 
That should be our focus. Because we are living in kingdom of God, kingdom of grace today. So Christianity is not about having a successful life. Christianity is about being faithful. When we are faithful to our duty and responsibility as his ambassador, his representative, a faithful uh, sign of a salvation, we will be in kingdom of heaven, kingdom of glory tomorrow. Because this is a journey with God. So focus is not how many sins we have. Focus is S-O-N, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So I hope, you know, your focus is not just heaven-centric, but Christ-centric. So based on that notion, I will, you know, uh, share with you my conviction on Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Let's read this again, shall we? The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of a sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. After 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus enters into synagogue and he is having inaugurational speech. Yeah, he is uh, proclaiming uh, the day of Messiah has come. So when you look at you know, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he is referring Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is a messianic job description as Isaiah 58 is our job description. I know some of you probably remember only Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14, how to keep the Sabbath holy. But you have to keep the entire job description, not just the last two verses. Um, but we will get there. Maybe I will share that with you next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but when you look at Isaiah 61, you can conceptualize three major engagements of our Messiah on earth. God's missional engagement on earth. First is to proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. I know some of you are probably saying, no, that's not what the Bible said. He came to preach the good news to the poor. I'm not poor. It's not all people. Well, uh, hold on to that. I will, I will come back to it. Is that okay? But first, let's agree. Jesus came to proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. No one is excluded in the kingdom of God. Whether you are tax collector, Roman centurion, prostitute, no one is excluded in the kingdom of God. So he came to preach the good news of salvation to all people. And then second part, you know, he came to demonstrate love of God. Amen? Yeah, tangibly, recognizably, and visibly. And then third, he came to fulfill his majestic commitment to restorative justice, the year of Lord's favor. Probably some of you heard first two, but we somehow do not focus on the importance of restorative justice that much. So I will try to give you some overview on that today. But anyway, after he read the scripture, Isaiah 61, you know, he rolled up the scroll and gave back to the attendant and sat down. That was the actually order of the uh, synagogue uh, worship hour. The rabbi would read the scripture as a stand, then he would sit down and then begin to have expository study. It was more of the dialogue, in fact. So, here, Sabbath morning, all the eyes in the synagogue were fastened to him. You can hear the pin drops that Sabbath morning. They were wondering what Jesus would say about Isaiah 61, messianic missional statement in a job description he just read. He said, today, very day, today, this scripture, messianic missional job description, is fulfilled, finished. This is the same word that Jesus spoke at the cross of Calvary. It is finished in your 
hearing. What was the response from the synagogue that morning? You know, all the people in the synagogue were furious. The word furious in Greek, it means mad, enough to kill somebody. Yeah, they, when they heard this, they got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to what? To kill him. This is during Sabbath hour. What happened to that thou shalt not kill? This is not even after sunset. It was the middle of the worship hour. They decide to kill Jesus. Something wrong with this picture. What's going on? Well, you know, there are a lot of other things that I can share with you, but, you know, uh, for the time being, I'm going to jump right into a conclusion. First, first red flag here. He read Isaiah 61. That was a no-no. Only most respected rabbi, prestigious rabbi, we read Isaiah 61 perhaps seven times a year whenever we celebrate like major you know, uh, celebrations like Passover. So this is, this is holy cow scripture. It, it's, it's, this is not something that anyone can just grab and, and read. Does that make sense? Yeah. So first problem, he is reading Isaiah 61, holy cow scripture. And he's from where? Galilee. Nazareth. You know? This is not acceptable. He is not respected rabbi. He didn't even go to the cemetery, I mean the seminary. He doesn't have all this in you know, a credential behind his name. And reading Isaiah 61, not acceptable. Second problem, while he was reading Isaiah 61, he said, the recovery of a sight for the blind, which is not in the Bible, Isaiah 61. This is a blasphemy. When they were reading scripture, they read word for word, not like we read, because they don't want to mispronounce the Holy Scripture. And adding your own commentary, this is not acceptable. Once again, it's a blasphemy. But he said that, you know, in his own uh, 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 words, in uh, Psalms and other places. So, he had a right to add his own commentary. He is God himself. He is a Messiah himself, right? But people who are listening, of course, this cannot be. Ah. So that was the second problem. And then third problem, it gets worse. You see, during this time of Jesus, Israelites, they didn't care much about Messiah preaching the good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness of the prison. They didn't care none of that part of the job description. They focused on only two, the sign of end time, they said. The year of Lord's favor, and the second, the day of vengeance of God. Those two were the, their focus. When Messiah comes, the year of the Lord's favor would be reality, and the day of the vengeance of God would be, yeah, the Romans would be out, Gentiles would be out, Samaritans would be out. We will restore the nation of Israel once again at the center of the entire universe. So out of these two, which was more important than the other? Of course, the second one. That was the most important the sign of end time. But here Jesus didn't even bother to read it. He ended with the year of the Lord's favor. They were just waiting for the punchline. They were waiting for the last statement, the day of vengeance of God fulfilled. But he didn't even bother to read it. Wow. I mean, you, you wonder why they decided to kill Jesus. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the first problem, the poor. Jesus came to proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. And some scholars still argue, even today, you know, that is not the case. Well, I 
I have studied, you know, uh, some extent the, the word poor, and uh, many schools of uh, discipline agree the poor has been used over 2,000 occasions. Some people say 2,300, some people say 2,200. Well, that's not the hill that I'm going to die on. It's not a salvation issue to me. But it's more than a 2,000 for sure. But what's most important? How the word poor has been used. The word poor has been used 80% of the time as holistic poor. We call it holos, and which means physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually being poor. You are not having abundance of life, fullness of life. So when Bible talks about being poor, it's 80% of the time you are not having fullness of life. Physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. And 10% of poor, you became poor due to external influencing factors like disaster, famine in the land, war. You became poor. And then last part of the 10% is mismanagement of your financial resources. So when we talk about prodigal son, yeah, that's the part that we associate with. Does that make sense to you? So when Jesus was reading Isaiah 61, he was reading this verse right here. 80% holistic, poor. So physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually not being well. To me, that is all people. Amen? So he came to proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. And the second part is, is, is not, I think, a lesser critical. You, you all understand you know, Jesus came and, and uh, went to the, all the villages and the towns and the healed the sickness and disease. Remember that? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> he did not cure the disease. He healed people. Yeah. That word healing also comes from holos. So let's say I, I have a leper, uh, leprosy. I'm a leper. And I've been discommunicated, disassociated from my family. I am no longer father to son and wife or husband from my family. And I'm also disenfranchised, disconnected from my neighbor, my community, because of my disease. But when Jesus healed me, my broken relationship with my family, my broken relationship with my community has been reconciled, restored, reconnected. I am father once again. I am a husband once again. I am a son and daughter once again. You know, I am reconnected to my father, my parents, my family. I am also reconciled my broken relationship with my neighbor, my community. I'm part of my society once again. That was the reason why Jesus was in healing ministry. Is that okay with you? Yes. It's a ministry of reconciliation. It's a healing ministry through the restorative justice. Yeah, the, the year of the Lord's favor, which is referring to Jubilee. Every 50th year, God has placed this restorative justice button in, in humanity so that every 50th year we will practice jubilee so that land will be returned to the rightful owner. Slaves will be free from their bondage. If you owe mucho pesos, you are forgiven. So it is designed by God to restore that broken relationship. Does that make sense? But the challenge has been 400 years between the Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, and the John the Baptist, the first prophet of the New Testament, these 400 years, they did not practice Jubilee. In fact, they have replaced this sabbatical law, God's law, with their opinion and their urge, how to keep the Sabbath holy, and come up with this 638 suffocating rules and regulations 
policies and policies and you know do's and don'ts rather than focusing on God's will they focused on their preference that was the reason why you know the people were saying when Messiah returns the day the the year of the Lord's favor the Jubilee will be the sign does that make sense yeah yeah so uh, if you don't remember any Greek word, please remember this one word, holos. Because when you go to heaven, St. Paul would ask you, you know, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that word holos is actually uh, connected to the talos. Jesus said, I want you to be perfect as your father in heaven. He's actually talking about Telos. It's not like you're becoming sinless human being and the developing unblemished character. God wants you to have abundance of life, fullness of life. This is the very reason another disciple translated into be merciful as your Father in heaven who is merciful. I hope you get that. We okay? Yeah. All right, good deal. So, but the, as I said, during this 400 years, uh, Instead of focusing on God's will, they focused on their urge and their opinion. And due to that, they have developed the, 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 this retributive justice rather than focusing on God's restorative justice. When you look at Old Testament, the word justice and righteousness were two separate words to describe. But when you look at New Testament, in these two words have become one word because Jesus has fulfilled at the cross of Calvary. So when you look Book of Roman, every time you see righteousness, you can replace that with justice. So our focus should not be retributive, but restorative. There was a very you know, challenge that Jesus encountered with his even disciples and the people around him. Because they, 400 years, they focused, they were fixated with retributive justice. When Jesus returned, well, the Messiah comes. Yeah, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. God will punish all these people. This is what Jesus said again and again and again. No, that's not the focus. You have heard eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, but I say unto you, restorative justice. So if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. You heard that before, right? You know what's that mean? When, when Jesus said that, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. They knew exactly who Jesus was referring to. The anyone is Roman soldiers. Yeah. The Roman soldiers had authority to command any young person on the street and, and require them to carry their heavy gears like backpacks and shields one mile. That was a Roman law. So usually at the end of that journey, the, the, the young man will distance himself from the Roman soldier far enough and then spit on the ground and, and, and cry out loud to the Yahweh asking God to punish this Roman soldier. Send the thunder or you know, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. You see? That was the common practice, and then they will run away. So Jesus is saying, stop. Stop doing that. Go another mile. Break the Roman law. Go another mile voluntarily. Show the Roman soldier is not your Lord, but our grace and mercy for God is your Lord. That was restorative justice. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But, of course, they didn't like that. They wanted a retributive justice. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. And he continued saying, you know, if uh, someone slapped you on the right cheek, turn the other. What's that mean? 
let's say I, this, is, this microphone is, a, is an invisible human being, okay? Just, just imagine with me, all right? So if I am going to strike him, which side of the faith will be contacted? The left side, because he is in front of me, right? So I am slapping him, and uh, his left side should be contacted. But the Bible says right side. Uh, how that works. Is, is that mean like I'm kind of going at him and, and suddenly I decided to change the direction? And it's, no, no. What I did, I backhanded him. I backhanded him. So if I slap him with my palm, it means you are equal with me. I respect you as another human being. So I slapped you with my palm, my hand, as a dignity and respect. But if someone slapped you, the backhanded, it means you are less of me. You are not equal with me. You are, in fact, not even human being. That's what Jesus is saying. If someone insults you, treats you, and you're less than a human being. Yeah. Show who is the boss. Is that right? Show who is God. By turn, the other side. Yeah. That was restorative justice. So I really want you to understand the importance of the ministry of reconciliation through the restorative justice. But somehow we have forgotten about the importance of the God's majestic commitment to fulfill this restorative justice because that has not been our focus. We focus on our own, the end time, signs of our own preference. Have you seen this sign? <laughs> FedEx? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are two negative space, um, core values of a FedEx built into this uh, logo embedded into it. Uh, uh, one is directional arrow, the other is a spoon. How many of you see a directional arrow? Okay, those of you don't see, those of you don't have any clue what's going on this morning. <laughs> okay, well, there, there, is a, there is a directional arrow right here. You see? So delivering a goods and services from point A to point B, anywhere, anytime. Where is a spoon that we use to eat? How many of you see? You, oh, yes, 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 right here, right. Yeah, yeah, that's the spoon. Because a FedEx has, FedEx Care Foundation, they invest millions and millions of dollars every year for um, education, inequality, uh, environments. You know, the, the founder of FedEx, Mr. Fred Smith, he was quoting Zig Ziglar's uh, quotation. You probably heard this. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, that, that's the, the background. Yeah. But we see this FedEx all the time. But we don't see those two core values embedded into because we have a very different view. So I ask you once again, are you heaven-centric or Christ-centric? Ellen G. White reminds us we must be a Christ-centric. Let's read together, if I may. Christ, method alone, will give true success in reaching the people, the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. You know, people ask me, you know, because I teach social innovation, and one of my class, Ministry of Reconciliation, is cross-listed with the seminary. And uh, is there any seminary in here? Okay, okay, uh, you, you, you must take my class. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, all right, so people are asking me, you know, what is the latest, 
you know, most effective evangelistic strategy. And whenever, you know, I hear that, I just want to smack their head with the Holy Bible. <laughs> because it's, it's not about the latest you know, effective strategy of uh, evangelism. No, it's Christ's method alone. Christ's method alone will give a true success in reaching the people. The, we must mingle with the people in our community. You must be part of your community. You must join some civic organization. I know uh, Mr. Kevin Brown, he's a member of Rotary International. Good for you. You should join Chamber of Commerce, Kwanis, Lions, Hunger Coalition, whatever that passion is. You must be part of your community. Is that okay? Yes. If you say, I don't have a time for, I go to school, I go to work, and I go home, and I'm sorry. It's not a ex good enough excuse. You are mandated by God to mingle with the people in your community. And some of you probably will say, well, they are sinners. We cannot hang around with the sinners. Well, last time I checked, we are all sinners. That's why we need Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Only difference is, oh, my goodness. Is that okay for me to uh, torture you a little bit? Okay. Um, the, this is what I will do. I, this is something... Completely out of line, but uh, I think you will get it. Again, if you don't like my presentation, blame on Brother Lala. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, we will have two groups of people. First group, we call it sinners. Second group, we call it sinners. 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 Not saints. Sinners. We saw this at the cross of Calvary. Remember? Two sinners, left and right of our Jesus Christ. What's the difference? One group of sinners have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and the Lord. The other group of sinners rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior and the Lord. So our focus should not be how to retain people in this group. Our focus must be, how do we expand the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven so that more people from this group of you know, sinners will join with us today so that when Jesus returns, we have more people to celebrate His homecoming. Is that okay? So it's not about us versus them. It's not about us versus them. It's about precious souls belong to God. Amen. So we must mingle with the people in our community and then must have a desire for their good. For their good. Is that okay with you? We must put others before us and above us. But sometimes we have inward focused, internally focused, corporate churchianity uh, and, and, and continue forgetting about importance of other serving Christianity. I mean, this is the very reason people say, treat others as you would want to be treated. That's, that sounds okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I, I hear you what you're saying. But to me, biblically, it is more likely to treat others how they want to be treated. Is that okay? Yeah. Because we must have desire for their good as they want to be treated. So then he showed his sympathy. Yeah. He tangibly, recognizably, visibly. It's not just talking about, oh, I will pray for you, my brother. I would think of you in my thoughts and prayers. And we forget. We even promise that. Christianity has to be recognizable, visible, tangible. And that cannot be done without committing our lives intentionally. And minister to their needs. Again, holos, physical, 
mental, social, and spiritual well-being. You cannot just focus on spiritual well-being and ignore the rest. It doesn't work that way. Or vice versa. You cannot just focus on physical well-being and ignore the rest. It doesn't work that way. It's a whole person being well. Then we will earn our right to share the truth. We must earn our privilege to share the good news of salvation. If you just show up once a year according to calendar of events, follow me. People will say, uh, who are you? Because you have not earned the right and privilege to share the good news of salvation. So this is the journey of life, building that relationship. So Christianity is not about you know, institutional public you know, uh, uh, presentation. It is about individual life on life relationship building. Life on life evangelism. I mean, there is a time and place for public evangelism. I'm not denigrating the importance of it. But before public evangelism, we must invest our time and resource and energy in building relationship with the people. Amen. Then we can say, come and hear what we have to offer. Is that okay with you? And, you know, I'm from the School of Leadership, and we, we, we teach the leadership you know, theories and, and uh, applications and principles. And the Dr. Posner and Coos, in, in their book, Leadership Challenge, they said, if you don't believe in the messenger, you won't believe the message. Yeah, this is a school of leadership telling people. If you don't believe in the messenger, you won't believe the message. So we must become dependable, trustworthy messenger first. Then our message will have a greater influence over others. If you just go out in once a year and passing out track at the grocery store, at the gas station, and without building any relationship with the people, those tracks would not have any influence over people. You would just brag about how many tracks you have distributed. At the end of the day, it's not about how many literature you have distributed, how many lives you have built relationship with. Is that okay? So in my book I said, and I, I get some criticism now and then, but I am convinced the Christians, we have divorced the teachings of Jesus from the method of Jesus, yet we want and we expect the results of Jesus. We call that an academic oxymoron. Is that okay with you? Yeah. So, Scripture is fundamental source for one speaking with the Christian voice and acting out of Christian conviction. So, words interpreting the deeds and deeds embodying the words. You cannot have this compartmentalized, dichotomous model in a social gospel versus evangelical gospel. That is man-made, kingdom-focused faith. Christ-centric is both words and deeds. People must hear the good news of salvation, and they must see the God's visible, tangible, and recognizable presence with us. This is why I am very adamant your church property, your health care, your educational institutions, your property is not your presence in the community, but your personal engagement in the community is your presence. So at the end of the day, it's not about how can we build a bigger church. That is wrong focus. That's kingdom-centric. We must be Christ-centric. Are we the people? Christ.
calls us to be. Amen. So as I conclude, please remember, this is actually the quotation from Dr. Jim Putman. Let's read together. A disciple is a person who is following Christ, is being changed by Christ, and is committed to the mission of Christ. So we cannot just have had faith. That had faith must be connected to our heart faith. And that heart faith must be connected to our hands. So logos, pathos, and ethos. So it depends on your theology, you will have very different ethics. I hope you are Christ-centric rather than heaven-centric. Thank you.